Welcome to the Dairy News and Views podcast, a production of the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team. Our podcast covers current educational, research, and industry tools available for your operation to manage healthy cows and calves while producing the highest quality dairy products. Thanks for joining us here today on Dairy News and Views from the ISU Dairy Team. I'm Jen Bentley, Northeast Iowa Dairy Field Specialist. I'm here with Fred Hall, Northwest Iowa Dairy Field Specialist, and Brian Doherty, Ag Engineering Specialist. Well, Fred and Brian, it's getting to be that time of year, rolling into corn silage season, and uh, we have both of you from Northwest and Northeast Iowa here today. So how do you think things are shaping up for corn silage season? Out here in Northwest Iowa, we've really had a pretty good growing season. Uh, We've got some spotty conditions on the the uplands where we might see some corn that's been a little more stressed, but for the most part, things look pretty good. I was over in the very western part of our county uh, there on the state line. We've got a lot of pure sand soils and actually saw a guy opening a field up. It's a small field, notoriously dry. I stopped and visited with him and he said it's testing out at about 75%. So he thought that field probably be ready to go by midweek. Yeah, so uh, here in northeast Iowa, corn looks pretty good most places. You know, we missed, uh, most of the northeastern counties missed a lot of the the heavy winds from that last major storm that went through, and we've had plenty of moisture, so corn looks good. I would suspect most people are probably three to four weeks out from corn silage harvest. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of thinking too. I kind of followed Ryan Lang, our extension agronomist crop notes, and that's kind of what his estimates are are right now too. So yep, it's going to be a busy time of year. And you know, we all know that making corn silage is probably more labor intense part of the jobs on the dairy farm, you know, whether we have a custom operator on there or we're doing it ourselves. But a lot of, a lot of things take place in a very short amount of time to get feed for our cows up for the next year. But really need to make sure that, you know, we're paying attention to make sure every effort is possible to harvest it and store it. A lot of energy goes into that kernel. And if you look at what's in that kernel, that corn kernel, there's a lot of sugar or carbohydrate, which we call starch. Um, That's really what's utilized by those cows, those microbes in the cow's rumen, just really provides a rich source of energy. So when those microbes can utilize or ferment those sugars, they produce that volatile fatty acid and that really drives the cow's metabolism. So we can get that corn silage up with high quality, right amount of moisture. Um, That's really a good base for a lot of our dairy cow rations here in the Midwest. So really need to keep that in mind as we come into the fall harvest season. So today we're going to talk about, you know, some of those details and benchmarks prior to getting started with harvesting, just to kind of have those in the back of our mind as we uh, get set up for the season. And really, Fred and Brian, I think we just want to visit about some of those key points as as we walk through this and knowing that that feed has to last us for pretty much, you know, year 2021 as we start thinking about that. So we need to understand that making corn silage requires moisture for fermentation and to minimize the dry matter loss and spoilage. Fermentation of green chop into silage is carried out by bacteria that transform some of the the sugars into lactic acid. Corn should be harvested at a moisture content of around 65%, maybe up to 70%. Above 70%, uh, the potential of spoilage is increased and seepage increases, and that results in undesirable presence of Clostridia bacteria formation. On the other side, when you make silage when the corn is too dry. It doesn't pack right. You don't exclude air. You have poor fermentation and heating. Dry silage creates uh, higher levels of spoilage and a shorter bunk life. Testing should start uh, for water content once the kernel reaches the dense stage. Once you've determined the percent of moisture, you need to be aware that the whole plant moisture has an average dry down rate of about half a percent per day. You know, there's lots of different ways, uh, different gadgetry that can be used to test moisture. Probably the one we've all used and, you know, is 
fairly easy once you've got the steps down is just get to that microwave, gather your, or your silage sample. Uh, you'll need a scale, a paper plate or bowl, and a glass of water for the microwave oven. Put the, the water in the back corner of the microwave and then dry your plate out takes about a minute on high power and then weigh that plate. Put 100 grams of silage onto the dry plate, then adjust your power setting down to 50% and run it for four minutes. Then weigh your sample and repeat. And you want to do that until the, the sample weight changes less than two grams. And at that point, you can go through the mathematics and calculate what the percentage is by comparing the dry weight to the, the wet weight. After determining the moisture content, Jen, the next key area is chop length and kernel processing, as these are the key to proper packing and ultimately digestibility to the cow. Can you tell us a little more about that? Well, yeah, like you said, ultimately that, that chop length is going to be pretty critical for that cow to, to digest, you know, that corn silage uh, later on. But, you know, recommended cutting height is generally about four to six inches because that really is going to maximize the silage yield and, and milk per acre. You know, you have to factor in when the chopper can get to the farm if you're having a custom chopper come in. Um, so if you're at the right moisture at that time and the chopper doesn't come for a few days, then you might have to adjust that cutting height uh, just depending on when they're coming into the farm. So keeping that in mind, but you know, in order to promote a good fermentation, it's really necessary to remove as much oxygen as possible from that forage that's being ensiled. So accomplish that, we got to pack that down and get it compacted. So that theoretical length of cut is what we call that TLC um, for processed corn silage is about three quarters of an inch. Um, if the, the forage is not going to be processed, then that theoretical length should be about a qu quarter to a half inch. So if that chop length is too coarse, it becomes really difficult to pack and there really could be some problems um, from spoilage and just poor fermentation. So we really want to get the best pack to allow for that fermentation to happen. And that kernel processing, you know, that literally unlocks the energy potential of that starch contained in those corn kernels, like I was mentioning before, uh, because of that protective layer of the kernels is damaged, which, you know, leaves the starch exposed for microbial fermentation in the rumen. So we can break up those cobs and kernels, increase that surface area. That's going to help improve digestibility to the cow, uh, less sorting, and just, you know, results in higher density silage that just pack, ultimately packs better. A kernel processor's greatest benefit may be when there's harder kernels. Uh, maybe if we have a delayed harvest or are dealing with some type of drought, um, that kernel processor is really going to allow to break that open and allow the best digestibility. So, you know, they're kind of an expensive part of the process, but in, overall in the long run, getting that back in milk production is really going to be the best best route to go. So properly processed corn silage um, really should have no whole kernels. You know, as you're kind of starting that harvesting process, take a look at that and you may have to adjust your settings on the processor to, to get it to where you need it to be. So you end up with a good quality silage at the end. And then we have to consider inoculants, right, Fred? Um, how, how might producers utilize some inoculants when they're trying to preserve their corn silage? Well, as we look at the, the silage we've harvested, there's naturally occurring lactic acid bacteria in that green chop that can carry out this fermentation. However, there are other bacteria that also compete for the same sugars to produce other kinds of acids. Silage inoculates work by shifting silage fermentation in the direction that better preserves the crop. When the uh, lactic acid bacteria produce enough lactic acid to lower the pH to around 4, that inhibits the growth of feral microbe and, and halts further degradation. We kind of have to think about why we use inoculants. Uh, we want to enhance that ensiling fermentation. We want to reduce dry matter losses or shrinkage. Uh, we want to reduce anaerobic spoilage or heating and then ultimately what 
will increase increase animal performance. Uh, as we look at the general classes of these inoculants, uh, we've got homo fermentative uh, products as well as hetero fermentative products. Uh, the lactobacillus, hydrococcus, and enterococcus uh, all fall into that category. And in the hetero fermentative Bacteria, bacteria are the ones that we look at. The homolactic uh, products, they convert sugars directly to lactic acid. And they're the most efficient, probably the ones we use or, or see most often. The hydrolactic uh, products, they have a, a step where they produce not only lactic acid, but acetic acid and CO2. So we see them in a lot of products, but we really want to kind of focus on the homolactic species. Uh, they'll have the rap most rapid decrease in pH and really minimize fermentation losses. Applications, an important thing. Uh, as a rule of thumb, we want to supply at least 100,000 colony forming units per gram of forage. And to do that, we really have to pay attention to the instructions instructions provided by the manufacturer and make sure that our equipment is actually doing that. So it's important. I know we always say follow the directions, but this is one instance where it really pays to make sure we're applying the, the right volume of product to the silage. Brian, when it comes to co storing corn silage, what are some of the keys to making good quality silage? Yeah, that's a good question, Fred. So I would say probably the number one key for getting good quality silage is just getting good packing density and getting that silage well packed. So the objective there obviously is just to, you know, get as much air as possible removed from that silage and try to create an anaerobic environment pretty quickly so that you can get that good silage fermentation. So, you know, the best way to determine, you know, how well your silage is packed is to check your density. Density in, in bags and piles, it's, it's going to vary depending on the chop length, depending on, you know, what your dry matter content is, type of storage you're using, you know, how fast you fill that storage, you know, what you're packing that with, how quickly you pack it. So there's a lot of factors there. But, you know, for bunkers, we want to target density of around, you know, 15 to 17 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot for corn silage. Bags, you know, you're probably going to be more in the 11 to 15 range on those and so you know achieving the more of a matter of operator experience I would say with bags you know just kind of managing how quickly you fill that bag and then you know how tightly you can stretch that plastic without breaking it you know if you're dealing with upright silos you know there you're just depending on the weight of the silage itself to pack that and get good density so if you can use a silage distributor in that case to kind of spread that silage out more evenly over the surface you know that'll help you achieve a, a uniform density in that case and, and Brian as you're talking about you know that density of how much you need per per cubic foot, how much, or how do you determine how much you actually need to pack that in the bunker or pile? Yeah, so that can be kind of a, you know, a complicated question. You know, for bunkers or piles, you know, it's a good idea to try to calculate ahead of time packing capacity of your equipment, you know, before you start harvesting. You know, it's just kind of a simple rule of thumb that you can use. You can multiply you know, the estimated tons per hour that's going to be delivered to your bunker or to your pile. So if you know the capacity of your harvester, you, know, you take that and multiply it by 800 to get the pounds of packing weight that you'll need. So for example, if you've got a, a chopper that can supply 100 tons per hour coming into the bunker, multiply that by 800, you'd need 80,000 pounds of packing weight in that case. So that's kind of a simple way to do it. You know, if you want to get a little bit more detailed, a more accurate calculation, um, the University of Wisconsin has a spreadsheet that estimates silage density, kind of tells you what you need for packing weight. And so if you just do a web search for UW silage density calculator, you can find that. But when packing, you know, the thinner, the layer you, you pack each time, the better. You know, you want to shoot for maximum of about a six inch thickness for each packing layer. Research has shown that you can use uh, what's called a progressive wedge filling technique you can get a little bit better silage quality that way. When you do that, rather than, you know, spreading a thin layer of silage over the whole 
floor of the bunker, you, you start with, you know, your six inch layers over a smaller area, pack that, and then that, that surface area gets progressively larger as you fill the bunker. And then uh, when you're filling, you just want to keep in mind that you don't want your slopes on those piles or bunkers to be greater than three to one, just to help prevent tractor overturn for a, a safety standpoint. Once we've got that bunker filled, what's the next step? Yeah, so once you've got it full, the most important thing you can do then is just try to get that covered as soon as possible. You know, you want to get a plastic seal on there that helps maintain those anaerobic conditions and the silage. And it also, you know, keeps, you know, weather impact so you don't have rain infiltrating the surface and leaching nutrients out. Multiple benefits to having that cover on there. You want to use at least four mil thick plastic film. I'd recommend six, you know, would be certainly be better. And some people will even double up those layers. You know, it's, it's worth investing in that plastic film specifically made for silage covers. You know, they're often very tear resistant and they have UV light blocking to increase the durability of that cover. You can also purchase thin oxygen barrier films, and you can either get that as a separate layer or you can get that incorporated right into the plastic. Now, if you've got earthen sidewalls on your, your bunker or you've got kind of a trench silo design or, you know, if you have concerns that your concrete bunker walls aren't sealing well, they're not keeping the oxygen out, it can be a good strategy to line those sidewalls with plastic. So you lay the plastic in before you start to fill the bunker. And once you're done filling, you, you take those and you flip them over the top and kind of a it's almost like a burrito design so that can be a good strategy for dealing with you know issues with poor quality sidewalls and once you get that cover on you know you want to get it weighted down right away especially if it's windy out you know that weight helps keep the plastic tight down to the surface you know it helps prevent air infiltration so the most common method that you'll see is tire sidewalls but really you can use anything that won't puncture the plastic and so ideally you want those tire sidewalls or other weights touching each other so you want weight on that entire surface. If you don't have enough to do that, it is an option to take some rope and kind of tie those together to help hold that plastic down in between your weight. Brian, we've experienced a big wind here in mid-August. Are there any other points when we're harvesting some of this damaged corn that you'd want to add to it? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, we've had a very unfortunate weather event here you know and sometimes when you have these extreme events you know that leads to a decision you've got some down corn you might go ahead and try to make silage out of that rather than harvesting it for grain you know that can be a difficult decision to make but you know if you if you do some searching online you can find some uh, economic calculators to help make some of those decisions whether that's worth doing or not but the main point i would make is before you harvest for silage just make sure that you have a either a market for that silage you've got somebody that'll take it or you you've got a sufficient number of livestock to feed that silage to. You don't want to be in a situation where you have to make a quick decision, you go ahead and put that silage up, and then you don't have a use for it. You know, the other factor there is, you know, if it's wind damaged, you might be looking at a situation where you're going to have poor quality compared to fields that are undamaged, and the economic value on that silage might be a little bit lower. When it comes to harvesting that down corn, you know, certainly try to use a Kemper head if possible. You know, if you have to use a row crop head, you can kind of flat up the, the head angle and that can help kind of slide under some of that down corn and help it feed into the harvester a little bit easier. You can try harvesting, you know, against the direction in which it fell over. That can certainly help. It can also be very time consuming and just keeping the head as close to the ground as possible can also help. The other issue that we might run into here is, you know, we had some dry conditions in some areas, so some of that corn might have actually been a little bit drought stressed as well before it blew over. So in those cases, there is potential for high nitrates in that silage, and you can manage that by you know, raising your cutting height a little bit, which might not work if it's down corn or you can dilute it in the ration. But I just encourage people, if there's any concern about high nitrate levels, go ahead and submit a sample to a forage lab and get that tested. Um, the other thing I would just mention is that, you know, this is a very, you know, rapidly evolving situation. We're working on pulling some resources together on this. So if you're looking for more information, you can do a web search for ISU Extension Disaster Recovery. 
and that should pull up a page. We're working right now to get that updated pretty regularly with more information on you know how to deal with some of these weather damaged crops. What about some of the aflatoxins and toxins? Is that going to be a, an increased or heightened concern? Yeah, I think it's a little early to tell yet as far as making it with corn salad. The, the corn that, that snapped off completely, you know, that, that plant's going to start to die, so you're going to want to get that harvested pretty quickly here, especially if it's laying on the ground. There's potential for some contamination there. Yeah, certainly longer term, you know, if we're looking at taking that corn for grain, I suspect we're going to we're gonna have some serious challenges this year with, you know, get, getting that up you know, and then in a good quality, it's probably going to be low test weight. It's going to be hard to dry. And there's going to be a lot of potential there for molds and mycotoxins in that grain. And that's something to watch out for. And we'll be uh, putting more information out on that as the situation develops. The other thing I, I would encourage producers to be aware of as we're looking at some corn that's been laid down is we'll have some higher ash percentages than we're used to. And as we go on the feed out side of that, that's one of those things we'll have to adjust as we're building our rations six months down the road. Yeah, and Brian and Fred, I would just add, you know, Brian, you mentioned, you know, having to sell some of that as corn silage if they were typically selling it as grain. And, and just to comment, we do have a resource on the Ag Decision maker website on pricing corn silage so you know if people just aren't familiar with how how to price that that's a good fact sheet to review and be able to plug in your numbers there so I would assume that will probably go on that disaster recovery web page as well well it looks like we covered some really good main points today you know we have really some five major areas when we talk about harvesting corn silage the moisture content the chop length, the use of inoculants, and then packed and stored properly just to you know provide a good high quality feed to offer our cows. And then you throw in some of those weather conditions like Brian and Fred were mentioning, and we really have to you know fine tune tune our management tips again. I want to thank Brian and Fred for being on this podcast here today. You know, another major topic of concern as we head into harvest season and that I'd like to visit about next time on our podcast is silage safety as we take a look at, you know, a lot of things going on this time of year. We're you know, might be in a rush to get things done. And we really need to think about the people that are harvesting and handling this feed. Uh, That's a very important topic that we shouldn't let go unnoticed. So again, we want to thank you guys for being here on the show today. And hopefully you'll join us here in two weeks as we talk about silage safety. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or combination inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu backslash diversity backslash ext.